Not everyone sees the world in the same way. That's plainly obvious if you've ever spent time in the Internet's comment section, but it's easy to forget that it's also literally true. Not all smartphone users physically see or hear the same way you might. And in the feature segment of today's show, we'll have special guest Aaron Linson of BlindPodcaster.com to talk with us about that on episode 070 of the Pocket Now Weekly, the once-a-week audio podcast where we discuss smartphones, tablets, and the state of mobile technology in general in 2013. I'm your host, Michael Fisher, Editorial Director at Pocket Now. And before we get into the feature, we want to run down the news that's happened in the past week. And here to help me do that is Pocket Now's Chief News Editor, Stephen Schenk. Hey, man. Good morning, afternoon, whatever time it is when you're listening. Yes, I, I love Tony's traditional sign-on. It's good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Yeah, covers cover it. all the bases, exactly. except dead of night. That's true. <laughs> yeah. Happy midnight sacking, people. With Pocket Now, we just don't care about the dead of night. That's you true. You guys really need to get some sleep. We busy, yeah. We'd we, we, we be busy sleeping and, and, and having drinks, socializing. Mm -hmm. But uh, we have a lot of news. We have not a lot of time to cover it. Uh, folks, we're sorry we're going to have to skip listener mail for this episode. We haven't done it in a while. We've actually been doing listener mail consistently, so we hope you'll forgive us this time. It was either retain listener mail or, uh, and throw out the news, or do the news and throw out listener mail. So we haven't actually done a legit news show in a while. And even though this won't be one, because it's a special edition podcast with the feature tacked on, we really need to get the news out because, Stephen, there's been a ton of it, right? <laughs> there are a lot of it going <laughs> out. Yes. So let's run it down by category. Let's just, we're going to give ourselves a half hour, and we're going to try and get through as much of this as we can, starting with Android. Do you, Would you like to... Um, to bring the news to the ears of those who've not heard it yet about Absolutely. the shattering of our, of our budget world? Seriously. So Motorola finally dropped its Moto G this week. Uh, this phone, we were following it as a DVX for a while, and at first it was just this very nebulous, somewhat cheaper Moto XE type phone for everybody who couldn't get it in the U.S. Mm -hmm. um, this Moto G name dropped uh, a little earlier this month. And all of a sudden, it really started building up steam. We heard about this announcement. Um, we started seeing it pop up early on Motorola's site. Anyway, it's official now. The hardware, it's not super great, but it's a lot better than the other phones in this price range, which is super duper ridiculous cheap. Uh, the U.S. pricing for the 8 gigabyte model is... Well, let, 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 hold on, I want to uh, say but, that for anybody who hasn't heard okay. it yet, because this is awesome, right? So yeah, like we see the Moto G pop up on the site early, and it's like, all right, whatever, it's going to be a budget X, but it's, okay, whatever. And then when it drops, I'm looking at the specs, I'm like, okay, what? Uh, uh, Snapdragon 400 at 1.2, we'll talk about that in a second. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> one gig of RAM, a 2,000 milliamp hour battery, basically, 8 or 16 gigs of storage, and guaranteed KitKat upgrade from Google. Okay, cool. So but about that really whatever. nice display? And, uh, yes, the 720p LCD, right? right. Um, nice, uh, fine, but we, nothing to get excited about. And we're like, why are they having a live streaming event for this? What is the big deal? And then we came to the price. And Stephen, go ahead. Yeah, what's, what is the price of this thing? Eight gigabytes going to run you essentially, I'm going to get this wrong if that's in my head, $170? 170 179 okay. I think. Yeah. It was like 80 I'm always rounding up or down trying to drop <laughs> that 999 So as a result, I get off by $10. And a 200 for the, the 16 gigabyte. So, so super cheap. $180 or 200 off contract. Yeah. Unlocked. <laughs> what? And, it, you know, we're not talking about like a blue phone or like a you know, some kind of um, Chinese knockoff. Like, this is uh, from Motorola. It's, which is Google now. Which, which is, is as close to Nexus Google. as you can get that's not. Exactly. I mean, this is just a continuation, a broadening of that kind of from Google thing that we started to see with the Play Store. It continued with Moto X, and now we've got the Moto G not breaking any barriers in terms of hardware, but doing it on the price point. I mean, I'm, I'm still... Like it's like the Moto phone of a couple years ago, right? Where where it was like whatever it was, twenty bucks or something. You, like you don't even need one, but you just want to go out and buy one because yeah, it's, you still, it's why not? Yeah, it's there. It's cheap, <laughs> right? And some people in the comments have been making the point, like, hey, a gift, like for people who want to get their kids a smartphone for whatever reason. If you want to get your kid a smartphone, like this is probably the way to yeah, go. Yeah, as a great starter phone, sure. Yeah, but the, the biggest thing isn't just that the pricing is so low; it's that the pricing is so low everywhere. 
Yes. It, it's not quite the super low U.S. prices, but I know uh, Clove has it on their site. I think it's like I worked out the pre-tax price because I'm trying to make numbers that aren't at all useful in the real world. But <laughs> their pre-tax 8 gigabyte one comes out to, I think, like 210 U.S. So it's definitely in the same ballpark. Right. It's not going to be like 100 bucks more. Exactly. It's not the situation like the Nexus 5 and the Moto X where overseas yeah, yeah. in some markets it's like, wow, this, this phone that would be 199 in the U.S. is actually, you know, 600 bucks. Yeah. Those numbers are not right. <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah, no, yeah, that's a really good point, and it's uniform across the globe. Um, there, are, the sacrifices that have been made also, though, are well. You know what's interesting is that you can customize the Moto G in terms of colors, but yeah. not with like something like Moto Maker. Like it's a much more traditional, like decade old idea of slapping on a different colored case. Yeah, but I'm sure we're going to start seeing you know, third parties, especially, come out with much more elaborate backs than these solid color ones Motorola's offering. So maybe you will get something like the two tone effect, the X saw. Pro- not not oh, as yeah, nice wave. looking, maybe, but you know, with some more variations. I'm just glad uh, in the promo video I saw of the G, there was not a, they were, they were using a 3D model of the phone. And it didn't appear to have the dimple on the back. And I was like, guys, if you took the oh, dimple no. off, I'm, I was just going to be so ornery. But no, it's on there. So you could, yeah. I thought I saw the it there from the yeah. pictures. Yeah, it's there. So uh, also, I asked Motorola for comment yesterday. We threw this in some of our editorials. The phone is being made. Uh, it's not. It can't claim the made in USA label like the Moto X can. It's it's being assembled in factories around the world. Which and should, I think that's, price. that might be one of the reasons why they're able to keep the price so low abroad, yeah. after cutting down on this international shipping significantly. Uh, agreed, yeah. Well, I, But I think there was a um, – they gave themselves some room with the Moto X. Like they don't only assemble those in America, I don't think, or they're not always going to always assemble them in America. They mentioned something at the launch event where they were like, listen, in order to give this thing global availability at some point, it, we have to make it elsewhere. Or I just think it's silly they're not shipping them to Canada or anything. I mean – Instead of a four-day guarantee, make it, what, five days and at least give yeah. those. <laughs> yeah. Canadians want this thing, man. I, everyone wants the Moto X because everyone in the press is like, I think the, the, the only phone that's similarly been hyped has been the, the HTC One in terms of overall user experience mm-hmm. quality. And I think it's deserved. I just, you know, it, it stinks that so many people want it as a result and it's unavailable in so many and parts I of the world. I still think the Moto X is too expensive, especially in light of what you get with the Moto G. Because there's a huge gap in pricing between those two. Yeah, there is, but there's also a huge gap in functionality. I mean, what are you not getting with the with the G? You're not getting the active notifications. You're not getting that context sensitive stuff. The touchless control. You know, all the specs have taken. I know out. It's, it's missing a lot of the really the fun stuff. Yeah. Do you know if it has if the Moto G has the um, uh, moisture repellent nano coating on its components? I have- no clue. Okay. I hope it does because then it's like a cheap phone that you can give to your kid and be like, listen, if you fall in the puddle, I'm, I'm going to be angry with you because of your shirt being I have ruined. no clue, so but I have, a very, I have a very fun way we can find out. <laughs> you want to you do some, some bathtub tests? I always want to drop my phones in the bathtub. Yes. I was just pouring water all over as the Ultra yesterday, and it was a lot of fun. There you go. Good there time. you go. So let's move on. The Moto G was awesome, uh, but yeah. we are limited time, so we have to keep moving on. Shall we move on to the other awesome piece of hardware that I can't stop talking about? <laughs> this be the LG G Flex, Michael? Yes! Yeah. Now, what's the deal? The LG G Flex, we've talked about a lot on this show. It's a curved smartphone from LG that is, I think has finally been released in South Korea. Uh, but we are hearing rumors that it's going to hit U.S. carriers, from what I understand. Yeah, I think this came from uh, FLeaks, has found from his sources that there seems to be evidence for the G-Flex coming to, I believe it was multiple carriers. He named three of them, I think, AT&T, T-Mobile, and one of the CDMA guys. Uh, I want to say it was Sprint, yeah. yeah, which is great. I mean, especially compared to the Galaxy Round, which is going to be nowhere and nowhere soon. This is a phone <laughs> that you might actually have a chance to buy. And I guess, I know this is a little bit old here. I just want to take this opportunity to talk about that a video of the phone bending. Yes. I don't think it's supposed to do that. No, I don't either. I okay. think it's a pressure test. So, that's, yeah, it's yeah, like meant I to mean, say like it'll survive it once or twice, but you okay. shouldn't do it. You can bend most smartphones about that same, uh, maybe not quite as far, but a couple degrees uh, like that. Uh, you shouldn't. Uh, but. Can, I, so, can, I, can I confess something to you? Please. I love this phone. I instantly already love this phone so much that I, could, I can't, still can't bear to bring myself to watch that video. <laughs> I've never seen it. I never will see it. it I don't want to see this thing. It doesn't bend that much. I mean, it can't bend that much. Right, because it, it's not that curved to begin with. And it looks like it's taking a lot of force to do so. Oh, God. Yeah, yeah. actually, you can see it on the screen. In one of the screenshots, you can see the n- amount of kilograms they're applying to the phone. 
God. Yeah. So anyway, that's yeah. This is exciting news. I really hope it's. Um, it I really could be super accurate. expensive for all we know, though. And so maybe we shouldn't get ahead of ourselves. Well, it's a good point because it is currently available uh, at uh, Negri. I don't know if it's at Clove yet, but I think it's at Negri for eleven hundred dollars. <laughs> <laughs> so it, we, if we can get one of these uh, listeners, we will definitely try to. I've been pushing. I think Anton and Brandon are ready to just kick me out the door and off the planet because every day I've been like, hey, guys, I, I think I found a new way to get the flex. And then it fails. And then 16 emails later, they're like, just would you stop? No one else cares about this thing. I'm like, I know, but I really like it. So anyway, um, that's the, the G flex. I, I, I am. I am. I'm, I'm a fanboy for, for new form factors. And this is a new form factor. And why not? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, hopefully, I mean, that comes from Evleek. So the, he's very rarely wrong. Um, in my experience anyway. So I'm really, really hoping this pans out. And until it does, we have other stuff to talk about, other exciting hardware in the form of Google Glass. If you didn't get your... If you didn't get on board that gravy train at the beginning of the whole situation, or the reverse gravy train, as it were, uh, you have another chance to do it. Because Google yes. has reopened their Explorer Edition program, yes? And with no little like audition process, because I think when they first started, you had to give a little description of why you would be a great explorer. And if I remember correctly, I don't think they actually looked into those at all or really <laughs> evaluated them, because a bunch of people, they had to take them away from after the fact. Wait, did remember they? Remember this? Yeah. Why? They, people who like, misrepresented their intentions or something, or they... Really? I, I believe that's what happened. But Google is done with all that now. If you just go and sign up, you drop your information, you can either say, hey... Send me some info when you have more to share about Google Glass, or I want to get on this wait list. As soon as you have more of these Explorer editions to sell to people, I want to buy one. And then presumably when you know the, the wait list moves and you get to your spot, you can have the privilege of paying 1500 bucks for one of these things. <laughs> now, I, I feel really left out. I've never worn Google Glass. I've seen it. I've now, it's only now gotten to the point where I've seen it actually in public and oh. not at a trade show. Like I've seen it in Davis Square here in Somerville outside of Boston. And how did that poor person eventually shake you from following them around all day? <laughs> I, I was pounding out the Nexus 5 review at the time at a Starbucks, and I was like, oh, man, I really want to go talk to that guy, but I really have to finish talking about this phone. Uh, so that didn't happen. But I'm excited to try it at some point when it's when it's lost all its luster and everyone is wearing one. And you know, I haven't heard in a while. There were those tours that Google was talking about, and I, I think Taylor might have gone to one of the events. He tried to go to one he of them. He tried to go. And didn't he, happen. I think he overslept. So. <laughs> <laughs> it was super early, like a weekend morning. I'm not going to yeah. wake up 9 a.m. to play with no, my mic. Not on a Saturday. For Google Glass. Uh, yeah, no. But, but I haven't heard have... about those in a while. There might be some coming up your neck of the woods. I hope so, because, you know, Boston. Uh, if there's, if you have fifteen hundred dollars and a desire to do this, you should check out that story. It's linked in the description. We like new, exciting, futuristic stuff, even though it's not that new anymore. Software also has some interesting stuff going on. Android four point four KitKat has landed for the Nexus Seven and Nexus Ten. Is that correct? Yeah, but what about the poor Nexus Four? I know. Well, the Nexus Four is still waiting, and they, the, what did they say? Two weeks on that one. I don't know. I, mean, I understand why it's easier to get this out for tablets, but disappointed all the same. Yeah. Uh, this is, I should make clear, this is for the Nexus 7 2012 and 2013 edition. So if you have an older Nexus 7, it'll still run, it'll run the new uh, version. Uh, that's very exciting to me because I have the first Nexus 7 and I haven't, I, I don't know where it is. I got to go find it and up, upgrade it. And that reminds me, I wanted to give a shout out. Mm -hmm. I didn't seem worth posting about in the news today, but I think Woot is having a sale on the, the 2012 Nexus 7 for something like $130. So <laughs> Really? If you don't mind having your old hardware, that's a heck of a deal. Of course that thing is going to be on freaking fire yeah. sale on holiday season. That's gonna, it's gonna, it's just, there, there are going to be Black Friday sales pushing that thing out the door for like 75 bucks. I imagine. I'm trying so hard not to even look at those. Yeah, you know, don't. I would be so tempted to. I can't say how well it works on KitKat, man, but I, you know, Jelly Bean with it seemed with every upgrade within Jelly Bean to my original Nexus 7, that thing would get slower. And it got to the point where I didn't want to use it anymore, which is why I haven't seen it in a while. So, you know. Well, that's why it's only 130 now. There you go. Yeah. You get, get what you pay, get for, what you pay for now. That's exactly right. So if you have an Nexus 7 or Nexus 10, check that out. Yep. Uh, and finally, in the, wrapping up the Android news that we are going to cover, the Google Plus, <laughs> the Google Plus <laughs> app for Android has been updated. These, these guys, um, they're not joking. They're, they're not, you know, this isn't a situation with, like, 
Apple Maps where they're like, uh, all right, all right, all right, you, we were wrong. We apologize. We'll, we'll get back to you when we've got something. But mm-hmm. no, Google's like, no, we built the social network and you're going to use it whether you want to or not. <laughs> they were doubling down on the Google Plus. Jesus Christmas. So what's the story? They've updated the app well, and now it's, it's, it's getting its hooks into other stuff. Well, that was the story initially. Uh, was it had this update to the Android app. It wasn't really about getting its hooks into more things. This was one of the more conservative updates. It did have some nice features, especially photo-wise and sharing, mm-hmm. uh, integration with um, Daydreams. You can have a nice screensaver with your Google Plus photos. The real news ended up after I posted this, and it came to light that Google had completely boxed the distribution of this and apparently built the APK where all the references to the Google Plus servers were to those special servers only for in-house testing, and the rest of us can't reach from the public internet. (laughs) And this wasn't just like someone, you know, ripped an APK from a phone and started uploading it to people who were then sideloading it. This was the official app as coming down through the Google Play servers. It was breaking Google Plus for people. I assume it's fixed by now, but that ended up getting a lot more attention than the actual content of the update itself. (laughs) Well, that's... Wah, wah, Google. Well, you know, accidents happen. I understand how that that goes. Certainly. We've... uh, had our share of those in the past, but like there's there's a an interesting corollary to this in that this is I think our first podcast since YouTube has um, renovated its commenting system, and this you know plays into the Google Plus story in that I don't think you need to have a Google Plus account to comment now, or you don't need to use your Google Plus I... name to comment. Yeah, you don't need your name. I have not been able to use my existing YouTube account without agreeing to the Google Plus Terms of Services. So okay. I feel like it, it does let you keep the old name. You don't have to use your real name, I don't think. Right. But you still have to transition the account to some Google Plus stuff. So that's that's where my disconnect happened. So I, I was not. Um, I, it's. I was fine with this change to a large degree because of Google's promises that, like, hey, people are going to have to use their real name now, and therefore trolling is going to be significantly reduced. And I'm like, okay, great. But in their um, lenience, maybe their necessary lenience in letting people retain their username as opposed to their real name, that really hasn't happened. Like, yes. No, no. And I'm hearing about content creators getting really upset now that they're seeing that these people who are having – a very just abusive or unpopular, well, not unpopular, but you know, negative um, comments are getting a lot of responses. And the way Google Plus is evaluating all these now, even if they're you know, nasty, awful stuff, because a lot of people are reading it, it's getting moved up to the top now, oh, and right. they're dominating the comments. Even though they have their real name, people can still be jerks with their real name. Absolutely. And I don't think Google quite counted on that. No, I don't think so either. And and you have this effect where it's like it's it's almost like a Facebookification of the YouTube comment section where the news feed um, on Facebook, a lot of people complain that the algorithm isn't twer- tweaked. I was about to say twerked. The algorithm isn't twerked well enough. And uh, you get all of these news stories pushed to the top of the feed that you don't really care about, but they're popular because of various reasons. Mm. And I've noticed that in a lot of our videos. I'll come back and, yes, I don't know which phone is vibrating. Sorry. Uh, I, I'll come back and I'll be like, uh, yes, I understand this comment has... 35 upvotes, but also I would like to see the new stuff. And to have to take an extra step to list chronologically is just, I don't know. It's not my favorite system yeah. overall. So We'll either get used to it or it will be tweaked in some way and change, but I don't think it's going away. Yeah. That was my Galaxy S4 Zoom buzzing the table. Buzzing the table aggressively with its <laughs> power-hungry vibrator motor to tell me the battery was low, by the way. Why do you even have that device powered on? I... <laughs> You know what can I say? It came. It came to my door, and uh, I, I, I spent some time with it. Anyway, let's uh, let's move on yeah. from Android before we talk about the Zoom. I don't want to talk about the Zoom. <laughs> uh, iOS, the iPad Mini with Retina display now available for your consumer consumption. And if you want one, I understand you should get one ASAP because word is this thing is going to be in majorly short supply this holiday season. Is that right? What's, what is that? Projections from somebody, from an analyst? I don't know what analyst was putting this out, but it was, I think, below 3 million units, something in the 2 to 3 range, which is almost certainly below what the demand is going to be to the tune of a couple million. So. Wow. Wow. I would love one. I was supposed to get one. <laughs> I was supposed to be the one to review this thing, and then I was out. Um, I don't know what I was doing. I was using my One Max somewhere, or my Z Ultra. No, it was the One Max. And I didn't get any work emails for two hours. 
So I come home and there are like 17 emails waiting for me. And one of them is a very long thread between Taylor, Brandon and Anton <laughs> with all these time sensitive things. Like I can get a mini. Should I get a mini? Michael, are you going to get a mini? Michael, where are you? Aren't you supposed to review? This? <laughs> you snooze, you lose brother. It wasn't my fault. The phone didn't get my email. Oh, oh, I was oh. so annoyed. So anyway, Taylor's reviewing the mini. He's not on the show because I'm mad at him for that. That's not true. <laughs> but <laughs> This episode of the wiki brought to you by spite. <laughs> Oh, God. Taylor Martin, you enjoy yourself with your iPad mini, you jerk face. Anyway, go get them. iPad mini is available at Apple if you like them. Uh, more interesting to me, the rumor that the Apple iWatch, still an unconfirmed product, by the way, but one yeah. that pretty much everyone assumes is going to happen, uh, is going to come in what, Stephen? In ladies' and men's varieties. Effing genius. Is it? It is. It, the number one question I get asked about my Pebble, about my Galaxy Gear, about any smartwatch I'm using, oh, wow, it's, yeah, that's pretty big. Is there a size for, for my kind of wrist? Because I talk to a lot of girls who want to know about my Pebble uh, and Galaxy Gear. You know what I mean? Yeah, I thought we as society has moved past the you know, different size timepieces for, for different genders. If you buy what's appropriate for your wrists, different sizes, sure, but the men's and women's, I don't know. Oh, well, I mean, I, I'm, I'm all for that in, in, in a social sense. And, you know, mm-hmm. but, but, but physically speaking, ladies' wrists tend to be significantly smaller than than men's wrists. I mean, this is true. I, I have dainty little wrists, so I don't know anything about this. But but then to that extent, I'm also wondering what effect this is going to have on the usability. If we're looking at so it was 1.3 and 1.7 inch displays that had been mentioned, and both and, OLED, and, which is interesting. That's yes. a weird thing. But go ahead, yeah. And uh, and that sort of works out to about the Pebble and Galaxy Gear sizes, give or minus, give or take. You can take a few tenth of an inch in either direction, but yeah. So. I just don't know if we're going to want a full touch-based interface in something the size of a pebble. It's a, it's a solid point. Is, is part of the rumor that there's going to be no physical button on this thing? I don't know, but I assume if it's Apple, it's going to be heavily touch. Or gestures, yeah. maybe. But Well, you know, don't, don't forget that the Nano, what was the size, uh, the screen size on the, the tiny Nano? Do it looks pretty big. I'd guess about two inches, but I don't know. Uh, I would look it up now, but I can't. But, you know, that was a very small screen, and it was quite easy to use in terms of the, the touch interface, I thought. So we, we'll see. I, I like this idea of different sizes. I think it's a um, an idea that not a lot of people have seized upon. Sorry, 1.55 inches for the Nano. For the Nano, 1.55. So, I mean, a 1.7 inch one, 1.3 one okay, might be so pushing it, but yeah. I don't know. You know, they, they even managed to implement some interesting two-finger gestures on the iPod Nano uh, when they had it. Like, you could do a two-finger tap and rotate the face so that you can uh-huh. use it in different orientations. And that I worked out really nice. So we'll see what they do. I really hope they do this different size thing, though, because that makes a lot of sense to me. And I can finally answer people and say, yes, there is an option for you besides the... Uh, the, the Swedish people we talked to? Not Swedish, Swiss. The Swiss <laughs> folks we talked to. God, that's the second time I've done that. I'm such an ignorant American. I apologize. No to countries, just countries. Yeah. What's the uh, Swiss <laughs> internet code? <laughs> what? I, don't, I always like, get this wrong. It's like CX or CH or something. Oh, you mean for the, the extension, the dot? Yeah, yeah, the TLD. Oh, okay. I thought it was. I thought you were like there was a code, a numeric code to get on the internet and <laughs> <in> all of. <laughs> if you don't know, you're simply not connected to the right people, Michael. <laughs> well, let's close that Apple here. Apple has made a massive investment well, in manufacturing. What's the story here? It's massive to me. So Apple took about ten and a half billion of the hundreds of billions of dollars it has, you know, sitting around in closets and under mattresses in Ireland. Yeah. <laughs> and it's uh, it's trying to really ramp up its uh, its manufacturing uh, lines, the ones its you know hardware partners are using, giving them all the tools they'll need to make the latest you know really high end stuff. Because Apple, they do a lot of really fancy things with their hardware. These you know aluminum monoblock cases, those mm-hmm. they look very nice, but they're tricky to mill down to get them super thin, remain strong. They have to do quality testing. It requires a lot of custom hardware. So Apple is you know, committing to all this now, and hopefully it's going to lead to or avoid situations like this delay that we saw with the iPad mini this year, if they can make sure they have enough stuff in the future. It, the $10.5 million seems like a lot. Apparently, this is nothing compared to Samsung, which sends something like $20 million a year. We're talking about bi- uh, a billion, billions with a billion. Billion, yeah, $20 yeah. Billion. Um, but then again, that's also spread out. Samsung makes a lot more different products than just Apple. So that's true. It, it's interesting to me, though. I mean, like with Apple already 
being the kind of king of this vertical model where they, they own, you know, a lot of the supply chain. Right? I don't know. I mean, is Samsung a, uh, would Samsung be a better example for that kind of thing? Because Samsung is yeah. definitely the poster child for that. Yeah. I mean, Apple's still buying a lot of their stuff from Samsung. Well, that's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they get, uh, where do they get their displays from? Is that LG or Samsung for the iPhone? Sharp. Who knows? Yeah. And then Sony sensors, right, for the cameras and so on. So I take back what I said. I think I was fundamentally wrong. Uh, we, I wanted to cover this because it's important, because I've been wondering where Apple is going to go with the rise of, of these competitors. I mean, I think everybody has eyeballs on Google right now in terms of what it's doing, in, both in terms of hardware and software now, thanks to the, the Motorola stuff. So it's like, it, it'll be interesting to see how Apple combats this. And I think this is a very important step they've taken. And yeah, and the sound of this feels like Apple's going to say stay strongly focused on the premium end of the market, and it's once it wants hardware that's really going to look and feel different from what anyone else can do. It's going to be interesting to see if the five C was was kind of one off. I don't know. I, I part of me still thinks we'll never see anything like the five C. I don't know. They say we're going to get two next year. Mm, yeah. Well, no, I, I believe we'll get two iPhones. I just don't but think maybe like either a of big them will look anything like the five C. <laughs> yeah, I Who knows? Yeah, I tried to ch- uh, I tried to switch my. This segues nicely into Windows Phone. I tried to switch my SIM on my AT&T account to, from a mini SIM, micro SIM to a nano SIM the other day. Uh, and they informed me they didn't have any suitable adapters. So I was like, bump You don't that. have a pair of scissors, man? What? No, wait. No, no, no. That's right. I know. But the thing is, then you have to, if you have to use your nano SIM in a micro SIM powered phone... Then you, then you get the adapter. You need, well, I, but I always need to do that. Oh. <laughs> There's the problem. So as a result of not having this situation, I can't use my Moto X or my iPhone 5C, and I'm kind of annoyed at, at that because I like them both for their for their various reasons. Anyway, I was in an AT&T store to do this, and while I was waiting, I kind of casually glanced over at the phone rack like you do, and there was this monster on the Windows phone rack. And I'm like, wait, wait, wait a minute. Hold up. And I power it on, and it's a Nokia Lumia fifteen twenty in an AT and T store. And I'm like, whoa! And I got so like, I, I I'm not um, I'm not good at controlling my emotions all the time. <laughs> so I just assumed I was so completely tuned out of the scene because I'd spent a week doing comparison videos and, and a review. I just assumed I was so disconnected from everything that I had missed the launch of the 1520 and i got really incensed at our um at our like pr contacts who didn't tell me or like send me one so i like i blasted out this tweet i was like here's a picture of the 1520 in the at&t store hey nokia we got to work on our communication uh-huh. <laughs> and then like 10 10 minutes later i kind of like calmed down and googled and uh yeah, turns out the thing's yeah. not launching until the 22nd the store just had it out early so i was like oh i'm gonna go ahead and delete that but interestingly i got responses from both official accounts for at&t and nokia on twitter and they were like what are you talking about after i deleted the tweet and i was like i'm sorry dudes you have a 1520 in your store what are you it's talking like, about yeah what are you talking <laughs> so i find uh the 1520 to be massive massive yeah, massive massive too massive yeah i i yeah. It, it was until i got my hands on um, it was it was too massive until I got my hands on the Z Ultra this week, and that so oh, God <laughs> right. But but it, it's not what you think. The, the Z Ultra sort of changed my thinking back in the other direction. And I'm telling you, if if what you really want is is a miniature tablet instead of an oversized phone, the Z tablet is, is it, the Z Ultra is amazing. And I think the 1520 could play in that space rather nicely because it's kind of the same physical embodiment. It's very very thin. It's very well made, as you would expect from a Nokia product. It's kind of like, have you spent hands-on time with the 925, Stephen? No, I have not. The 925 is cool because it's thin and polycarbonate in the middle, but aluminum on the trim. So it's nice. It's it's got a really nice combination feel to it. The 1520 just looks like a blown-up 925. Don't you almost wish that Nokia didn't go so quite over the bo- over the top here with its first phablet and we got you know maybe like a 5.3 inch sure to ease us in because not everyone wants a gigantic nearly a tablet that's very true but at, at the same time every time i pull out my lumia 1020 even i mean 4.5 inches is not that big people gawk at the thing and not because of its lens just because of its footprint and they're like wow that thing is huge and i'm forced to remember that a lot of people particularly in my area are used to iphone size and maybe the 4.3 inch size uh-huh. so you know i i really think that um people are already sort of blown away by the ballooning size of most regular smartphones and 
if I were Nokia, I would probably have made the same decision. Like, look, we're going to go huge, and yeah. that's going to get us some of the attention that we need or formerly needed before Microsoft ate us. Go big or go home. Ate most of us. Yeah, exactly. So the 1520 will be out soon. We have been promised a review device uh, from our friends at Nokia and AT&T, and they usually come through for us um, very quickly. So we will bring that stuff to you as soon as possible. I, and just so you know, I did ask to buy one, and they didn't have any in stock because I would have bought one right away. I was ready to do a video in the parking lot. You grab the one they have, you run out, if they text you, then you offer to pay for it. That's exactly right. Just snap the tether and walk away. Forgiveness, not permission. Right. Well, that's, we're a little behind. Let's move on. Rumors yep. are looking to Windows Phone 8.1 handsets. What's the story yeah. here, Stephen? Well, we've had Windows Phone 8.1 sort of on the radar out into spring of next year. We've heard a little bit about what sort of changes to expect. Um, eventually, this is going to lead probably to the unification of the Windows Phone and Windows 8 stores. Uh, there's been features like the removal of those hardware capacitive buttons that we've seen on all of these Windows Phone models thus far. Mm. We might get an Android-style virtual button, but we haven't really known much about the actual devices. Who's going to be first in line here? Um, over the weekend, a uh, leak released uh, named a bunch of Nokia code names. And uh, we've been hearing a little bit about what might happen with some of those. We didn't even know at the time how many were Windows Phone, if there might be some more tablets in there. Uh, and then today we hear that two of them in particular, the two that had our James Bond code names, many, Money Penny and Goldfinger, have been named as these first two 8.1 phones, Windows Blue, whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. And then, actually, since first writing that, we heard a little bit more about Goldfinger in particular. And it might have this crazy, like, 3D air touch, sort of like uh, Samsung in there. <laughs> no Gesture way. control. That's, I don't know exactly how it's going to work. It, it sounds like it might not be camera-based at all. And it might just use really elaborate capacitive sensors. Who knows? But Goldfinger might get that. That, that wouldn't necessarily be an 8.1 feature, though. But okay. we've heard about these two models, and they could be Nokia's, and probably the first ever to be Windows Phone 8.1. Well, that would be really, really cool. It'd be interesting to see a device that was designed for designed for the software, you know, to come out without the capacitive keys. I like the capacitive buttons. I wish the search button worked the way it used to, but otherwise I like the Windows Phone capacitive arrangement. Uh, I guess we'll see. I don't know. Soft keys are what everyone's doing. I, I, don't, I never got as excited about those as other people did. As long as they don't do a hardware home button, I'm fine with that. Uh, and the software side, we're finally seeing a uh, launch of Vine for Windows Phone. If you are a fan of six-second videos that you put on Twitter, that's awesome. More importantly, though, it's a very, very good sign for the platform. Uh, it's one of the two big announcements we heard from the from Nokia world. So 50% of that bundle of joy has been delivered. We're still waiting on Instagram. Uh, and then we can all feel a lot better, Windows Phone owners, fellow Windows Phone owners, that uh, our platform is legit. And it's we can funny sit at we the have, big kids' table and things. It's weird we have these two coming out now because they're such direct competitors. Mm-hmm. But it's great to at least have the option to choose between them in an official capacity. You know, that's a good that's a good point, Stephen. I wonder if any backroom deals featured that being used as leverage. <laughs> you know, like, like if, going if into the Instagram meeting. you don't hurry up, the other guy is going to beat you to it. Exactly. Yeah. Going into the meeting with the Instagram Facebook guys and being like, listen, we, we got Vine on the hook. So, I mean, you know, if you, we'll sign an exclusive if you don't want to be on our platform. <laughs> I, <laughs> tell the other guys exactly the opposite of that. Exactly. Playing against each other. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Oh, man. If that happened, oh, I want to... <laughs> I want to ask if that happened. So we'll see how that works. And wrapping up the entire news category, because we have to go, uh, BlackBerry obviously got a new CEO uh, who um, replaces Torsten Hines and it very surprisingly says, what? They want to yep. keep making phones. Yeah, they are going to stick with the course here. They think that they can still turn this thing around. I can't. Is that true? I mean, like, I'm, I'm re reading and rereading this news story, and admittedly, I haven't, like I say, I've been disconnected here, but this CEO's name is John Chen, by the way, if you don't already know. And his, his quote is, um, we have enough ingredients to build a long-term sustainable business. I have done this before and seen the same movie before. There are a lot of challenges, or otherwise I wouldn't be interested. Absolutely, there are a lot of challenges here. I mean... This is not sad news as far as I'm concerned. It's just incredible news because I, I, I don't it's, know. It's weird. <laughs> yeah. we, we, it seems so like, – it, it had to happen that we were going to see this sale go through. We had so many parties involved. Uh, we had – was it Fairfax was committed. Mm -hmm. There were like 
three or four other either groups or, or uh, individuals who were leading efforts. All these NDAs are being signed, looking over BlackBerry's financials. It's something like even if Fairfax didn't go through, there were like 10 other people lined up just aching yeah. to tear BlackBerry apart and you know sell what they could, make money with what they could. And now it's just like the past two months didn't happen. And we have a new CEO, and it's it seems like it's I mean not, maybe not business as usual, but in the same you know general path, right? And instead of a complete inversion, and yeah. as you say, a, a, a destruction of that fabric. And I would love to be a spider under that table as well, you know, just to see that turning point. I mean, I it must have been either an opportunity that they didn't realize before that we still can't see, or just a sudden upwelling of pride and stubbornness. Well, we heard that the board was pretty resistant to the idea of anyone tearing it apart and trying to sell off the components. So there may have been some you know, internal voices that these press reports didn't pick up on because it seemed like it could be a real possibility. But it's, I guess, a non-starter from within the boardroom. Ah. Oh, it's amazing. I, I really uh, continue to hope that they succeed. I know there's like there's like a lot of tragedy porn involved in watching BlackBerry. Like everyone gets off on, on seeing a company being do not doing well for some reason. I don't like that. I, I, I really hope that they manage to turn it around. I have you know, very little faith that they will, but go ahead. I just want something to happen because it feels like this is where the company was a year ago. I, I mean, know. We, actually, yeah. then we had more opportunity on the horizon, but just like it doesn't, it never completely crashes and burns. It never sees any success. It's just sort of like hovering around this near the bottom, you, yeah. you know, S or get off the pot. <laughs> right. It's seesawing on the ledge. And yeah, I've, I too have seen this movie before, but I maybe, maybe not, but it seems a lot like what, what happened with WebOS, where it was just on the ropes for a long time before everything went away. So um, hopefully, mm-hmm. you know, best of luck to them. And finally closing that out, uh, in yeah, that same vein... Good, Not everything's ahead. bleak. They have That's a new it, phone out. Exactly. <laughs> Improbably, this week, uh, Verizon is starting exclusive sales in the U.S. of the BlackBerry Z30, a device we uh, we asked for. Uh, BlackBerry promised us a review unit, but I, I think they've been pretty distracted. And <laughs> yeah. really, I didn't want to... Really more on their plate. Yeah, exactly. So anyway, uh, maybe I'll check out the Z30 this weekend at a Verizon wireless store. If you are interested in BlackBerry's listeners, you should go in the United States to a Verizon wireless store. Uh, it's been out in other markets around the globe for a while now, but uh, it's in the States. It's a big old BlackBerry. Yeah, larger screen, screen yeah. and uh, no keyboard. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. I mean, the um, the Z10 is uh, sitting with Jaime Rivera, but I, I have fond memories of it, so I will... I will go check yeah, it out. Good luck. Cool, yeah. cool. Let us know, listeners, if you go and check one out. Uh, leave us a comment on the, either the YouTube video here or the post at Pocket Now, or shoot us an email. For now, Stephen, I think it's about time for us to head into the feature, which means it's time for me to say hello to Brandon Miniman and goodbye to you. Well, but thank I, you so much for having me on here. We didn't go too over time. No, we that's didn't. A, that's we, a first. We are, yeah, you and I are a good team as far as efficiency goes. Efficiency, hells yeah. Tell the internet where they can find you. Um, and if you say your Twitter account, I will LOL loudly. My, my Twitter account? What's <laughs> wrong with my Twitter account? I posted to it once you, the other once week. Once the other year? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I didn't know if you preferred Google Plus these days or, or if you... <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Stephen... I have to go is, brush my teeth now. Oh. Stephen <clears throat> is at Stephen Schenk, if you want to find him. S-T-E-P-H-E-N-S-E-H-E-N-C-K. And uh, until next time, he will continue reporting the news from the Pocket Now News Desk. And enjoy the rest of the podcast, everybody. Thank you, sir. Take care. Well, folks, at the top of the show, I promised you a special feature on this episode, so let's get to it, shall we? It's my pleasure to welcome back to the show uh, Pocket Now's editor in chief, Brandon Miniman. It's been a while. Welcome back, sir. Hey, how's it going? And uh, our special guest. Aaron Linson, showrunner of The Cast Podcast and blog at blindpodcaster.com. Aaron, it's uh, been a long while. Welcome to, welcome to the show for the first time. Thanks. It has been a long while. We, we've been talking about this for some time. Uh, credit where credit is due here. I think, Aaron, you are the one who, who advocated for this, this podcast to happen a long time ago on Twitter. Isn't that right? Yes, it is. Yeah. I said the reason because that was as I was tired of watching the videos. And I was like, you know, I want to hear everybody's voice in the same room pretty much. So, you know, it worked out. 
<laughs> it did. It worked out well. At the time, we were we had been running the weekly for a while, and we were looking for um, some some ways to diversify a little bit, some ways to uh, to improve the show. So what happened was uh, we. We we just opted to do the show. I pitched it to Brandon. Brandon was like, yes, I really, really want to do a show about accessibility because we never talk about this, right? I mean, like, this is something that we don't cover. I think a lot of blogs it's don't over, cover this. It's overlooked a lot. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it gets it gets passed up a whole lot. I mean, Brandon, yet, you're very and, jazzed about this, right? And, and yet, if you look at device settings on most devices, there's an accessibility menu. And I think a lot of people graze over that and, and think, uh, think not much of it. But, you know, it's a very important part of the experience for some people. And we should talk about it. And guys, before we start the feature segment, we have an interesting bit of awesome timing from the folks at uh, Listen LSTN Headphones, uh, LSTNHeadphones.com. Just sent us a, a PR notice right before we started recording. This is not directly related to um, people with impaired vision. This has to do with people with impaired hearing. Uh, these uh, LSTN makes headphones that uh, are apparently. Well, excellent, but that's not really the point. They also donate a an amount of money to the Starkey Hearing Foundation, which is a uh, an organization that provides over a uh, hundred thousand hearing aids to people in need around the world each year, and is committed to over one million hearing aids this decade. So, if you want to learn more about that, that is uh, lstnheadphones.com, and uh, we're going to try and see what we can find out about these things and. Uh, see if we can get you some more information but just really great timing that i didn't want to fail to take advantage of so thank you to them for the heads up now let's get to talking about what we came here to talk about so i mean to establish a little bit of of um i guess credibility here aaron can you go into a little bit of your background uh in terms of your your particular impairment and uh and your background how it resulted in you forming the blindpodcaster.com yes i will well, I was born uh, four months premature, weighed a pound, and then Alex's like it basically fit in the palm of a adult's hand. Wow. And um, it had a whole bunch of complications with that. Um, had multiple eye surgeries. I have uh, what's called ROP, which is retinopathy of prematurity. Basically, that means that my um, retinas are really thin and that they could detach at any time. Now, what I mean by that is on the, the right eye, I can see a little bit. Uh, if you know anything about eye acuity, I can see uh, 400, some odd, 20 over 400, something like that. Wow. And that, but all that means is what you can see at 400 feet, I can see at 20 feet, and sometimes less than that, depending on whether and how much I have um, used the vision I have in my right eye. Now going on to the left eye is I can't see anything at all. And that's due to a doctor's mishap where I wear a, uh, a scleral show, basically a glass eye, in that in the left side of my face so that basically so that my face looks normal uh, to other people. So in your so in your right eye with the you said it's four hundred over twenty. Yeah. Right. So w- what is that what is that like? Can you see dark and light and any kind of color? Basically, see outlines of things. Like right now, I'm looking at my MacBook Pro um, 2012, early 20, uh, yeah, early 2012. I can see the outline of it. I can tell that it's gray, but I really can't tell anything else. And you can determine whether the screen is on and off, and that's that's about it, right? That's about it. Yes, I can tell. I do have it hooked up to an external 24-inch monitor to the right of it, so I can't tell that there's stuff on the screen. Mm-hmm. I know that I have Skype open and email open right now, but I really can't tell what's on there as far as words and icons. I can see that there's text and there's colors, but that's about it. And this has always been the been the case for you as a result of that birth, uh, the the premature birth, correct problems. I see. So. I mean that's that's interesting because I you don't often even think of the the desktop computer situation, um, but at, at least if you're in in my position, I guess. But that monitor is essentially just a status indicator to you, exactly. Just kind of a kind of a, a polar switch on and off. Two, the reason I have it is because this is a 13 inch MacBook Pro, and 
screen real estate is so precious to me because the bigger the screen is, the bigger, the much more wider field of, of uh, vision I get depending on how close or far the monitor is away from my face and where it is positioned. I see. So can I, can I ask a question? This is, so th- this is sort of a sensitive topic, and if, if I say anything that's insensitive, it's just because you know, I, I'm not asking it in the right way. Not at all. Um, and you know, vision is something I think a lot of us take for granted. You know, those of us that are blessed to have good vision. Um, how do you know what things are supposed to... I guess you don't know what things are supposed to look like because you've never actually seen them. I, I think I understand your question. Let me give you an example. <laughs> when I was in high school, I went to the uh, Kentucky School of the Blind from uh, my seventh grade year all the way to my uh, senior year in high school. I got my Eagle Scout in 08 before I graduated. And I remember my geometry class, and I remember almost failing my geometry class. <laughs> because they gave us these little objects and said, here, this is what a sphere looks like. And it's a little, little small ball, but then the numbers don't relate to the sphere. And so for me, it's like, okay, so why can't I have an actual, you know, I guess, life-size model of this because to me it didn't really make any sense and it still doesn't like if something's not going to fit fit in a box i'm going to get a bigger box until it fits in there <laughs> you know <laughs> right. i'm not going to go through and do all that math and do all the, the stuff that's required to do that because i just I, I don't understand that perception too uh, how some people can well okay most people can throw a ball and catch it mm-hmm. i have no um, hand-eye coordination at all. So, you know, somebody throws a ball at me, I'm going to get hit in the face with it before I realize, oh, i got to put my hand up to try to catch this thing. So, you know, I was really, never really good at sports and anything else. Well, let me tell you what, I, I, I was never any good at sports, and I, I have pretty good vision, so I, you and I are alike in that regard. Go ahead, Brennan. And do you find that your other senses, the hearing and sense of touch, are more acute? Um, that is actually a myth. Now, I know for me, um, being an audio engineer, going to school for music, getting my BA in music, concentrating in sound engineering, I have developed my ear more just because my profession um, tells me I have to, mm-hmm. and being, being the musician that I am. But a lot of people, um, a lot of people that are blinded um, later in life, say for macular de- degeneration, or who've come back from Iraq or whatever, um, really don't have that same, you know, those same experiences that have been told throughout, well, basically <laughs> throughout history. Now, what's interesting is my fiance is completely blind and also hanging in here too. So that's interesting. Wow. <laughs> interesting as well. And so we have had... Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's got to pose some interesting challenges to communication. Yes. Uh, so... Y- so, Aaron, you're you're a sound engineer. That's your day job. Um, the, yes. Well, it, well, it's it's my it's my degree program. It's a, it's a bachelor in music, concentrated in sound engineering. So I've got millions <laughs> millions of mics. I just got a uh, a new uh, mixer. So I, I this is what I want to. <laughs> Aaron is uh, Aaron is right now is listening to this podcast in the future. Uh, yes. Silently fuming at the at the noise floor problems we've been combating for the entire show. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I want to uh, I want to ask a little bit if we can if we can move into to smartphones because this this uh, this notion of you sitting at a desk having these monitors which are relatively I mean not useless but but far less useful than they would be to someone of uh, of more standard vision. I mean that's. It's fascinating to think about in the, in terms of you're using devices every day, who's like more than fifty percent of of their uh, of their real estate is dedicated to something that doesn't really help you at all. Exactly, and that translates to to smartphones. I mean, wh- where are we at right now? I, I kind of wanted to ask you, speaking from the perspective of someone who uses accessibility services very often, I, in a mobile sense, where are we at? in smartphone accessibility now versus where we were maybe 10 years ago when I think a lot of people were using um, sidekicks and, and things of that nature? Well, let's look back 10 years ago, okay? We had 
Symbian and Windows Phone. That was the, were the two major competitors at that time. Windows correct? Mobile and, and well, BlackBerry was around and, and Palm, but yeah. So let's just discreet BlackBerry for the moment. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, and the reason I say that is because they really didn't have anything on the floor for us at that time. Really? This Windows Mobile or Symbian. So okay. here's how this worked, okay? It's not like today, so we're going we're gonna to get there, but it's a backtrack. So you get this phone. I remember um, getting a Motorola, Motorola Q. Loved the thing. Yeah, and I had one of those. Still have it. Okay, so that was a, what, $100, $200 device, whatever, whatever the price was. Mm-hmm. Right. And then for us, we had to go and get a, what's called a screen reader on top of it, which basically reads out everything that a sighted person would see on the screen. This would cost us another $400. So that's wow. around $500, $600, even $700 for a phone, depending on um, what you wanted and what you needed as a feature set. So, so, this, so this device you put on the screen uh, 10 or 7 years ago, it would read the screen content. So, when you, so would you like press a button and it would start at the top? It would say start, 5.42 p.m. and so forth. Yeah, it was actually software that you loaded onto the phone. It was a really... Mm, pain in the butt process to do. Wow. And how big, what, what did the hardware, I mean, how big was the hardware in relation to the device? Well, it, was, it, was, it wasn't hardware. Oh, it was it just was, software? Just software. Oh, yeah. it was only software. Okay. But this piece of software was $400, $500? Yes. Wow. $500. So what a lot of people did that couldn't afford it is they would just get flip phones and they would just learn the menu layout. And the only thing we would be able to do is text. Uh, I'm sorry, is uh, make phone calls. Mm. AT and T graciously came out and said, "Hey, we'll provide the software for a hundred bucks." That was fine, but it was still a little bit expensive for what people wanted to pay. Now, I am going to say that a lot of blind people, excluding myself and a couple others, bitch and moan about app prices nowadays. And but we'll get into that later on. And I think that's really stupid. But <laughs> going forward, now we have major competitors, Apple, Android, uh, to some extent Windows Phone, and BlackBerry is not existent anymore, so you know, they're kind of dead out of the water pretty much. <laughs> we were talking about that in the news segment of the show, and they're you know, making their the fifth attempt at a, at a comeback now. So, But I, I take your point. I understand they're kind of not on your radar. We'll see what happens. Well, I mean, it'd be interesting to see what they come out with because they did have a, uh, a speech program for the before BlackBerry uh, 10 came out. Yeah, for BB7. Yeah, for BB7. I, I, I never got my hands on it, and I would, would have loved to, but I was, you know, I didn't, um, didn't at that time. So it would be interesting to see what happens with them. But it's, so Apple, Android, and Windows Phone now. Not two years ago, but now. <laughs> <laughs> Right. So let's look at Apple. Please. Okay. Well, many. I'm not even going to go into the closed, closed versus open garden debate because we can go round and round about that. And, and, and we have, yeah. And, <laughs> and, continue and, to do so. And, yes, and continue to do so. Apple has not the first to put accessibility into their products. And we just say that right now. A lot of people, a lot of blind people in the community praise and worship Apple who's thinking that they owe them something for including accessibility in there. They don't. Let me remind you that the NFB, which is the National Federation of the Blind, had to say, look, this is not accessible. I don't remember what it was. It was, uh, whether it was an iPod or iPhone or whatever, this is not accessible, make it accessible. So they were forced to make it accessible. Mm-hmm. just understood what was going on and so they ran with it so you know if I get hate mail from that okay whatever you know I don't really care uh, <laughs> well we'll we'll, uh, we'll keep a but, filter on there for you go ahead <laughs> but so you know we get these devices that are touch screen and I remember um, when the 3GS came out my dad said hey Aaron do you want to uh look at an iPhone 3GS and I was like not really because it's really it's a full touch screen and I really don't know how to use it or if it even be right it. it's just a flat slab of, of glass right yeah it was, a, it was a slab of glass and it was like okay I mean yeah so 
and it, this was a very, uh, very mature, uh, immature 1.0 version of uh, what's called VoiceOver, which is the screen reader for Apple products, um, whether that be on iOS devices or Mac computers. Okay. And we can get uh, the debate on uh, iOS and uh, Mac and the differences between those. But so looking at that device and being able to just to touch something and hear it say calendar, row one, or, or, or app one of, you know, three or four, or how many were on the home screen at that time, was, I was like, okay, this is, this is pretty cool, but, you know, am I going to be able to text? Am I going to be able to have a calendar? Am I going to be able to live life with this device as an assistant? Mm-hmm. And it turns out through 3GS, 4, 4, and the 4S uh, that uh, I did for a long time. And that was through the use of what was that? What was the app called? That was, uh, or was it just the built-in accessibility features that you're using? Uh, under you go into general accessibility, scroll to voiceover. Uh, right, the voiceover. Okay, yeah. Yes. So, so voiceover mm-hmm. is is helpful in productivity apps, email, reading text, but um, it doesn't do anything for really graphical things like games or. Or, or even maps, right? Actually, Apple Maps does work. Okay. Now, how good? You know, well, you can ask people in New Zealand who've gotten, you know, <laughs> you know, yeah, you, because of that. you don't, you don't need to like, you don't need to play with VoiceOver to see how how poorly Apple Maps does sometimes. No, absolutely. <laughs> oh no 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 no. Um, so w- with the games thing, you know. Games need to be developed for blind people as well. There's a lot on iOS more than there is on Android. But a lot of people say, well, every single app needs to be accessible. But that cannot happen. I don't care how bad you want it to happen. It just There's things that will never be accessible, unfortunately. And it's not a matter of design or the, the de- developer not wanting to. It's just it, they just can't. Whether you know it, it will lose focus for a second, and then it will just be a pain in the butt to use. You know, sure. Those things as well. So it's it's interesting to me. Like I, I'm still dealing with this notion of of thinking about a user with your sight restrictions using a device that still. I mean, yeah, the 3GS was a long time ago, but. You look at the 5, you look at the 4S, it, it, it's still a rectangle with a completely monolithic sheet of, of glass on it. I mean, where do you even start with something like that? Of course, voiceover is there to react once you press something, but how do you even know where to, where to press, you know? It's a lot of memory, uh, muscle memory, and also you can swipe right and left to go through different apps, and it will tell you, you know... Uh, so, sure. like, I'm an Android phone. It'll say Podkick Pro, uh, uh, you know, go- uh, Play Store, Google Music, stuff like that. And I can swipe through those and find them. Or I can do what I call, uh, what, what, uh, what's known as a score by touch, basically go through a thumb finger and move around the screen and see what's there. Mm-hmm. And get familiar with it. So then do you use the, the voice dictation to compose email or do you, do you type? I tend to do both. If I know, well, if I'm if I'm in my uh, dorm room by myself, I will usually dictate. Or if I'm out and about, I will um, touch type. Wow! So I mean, and you can touch type using a. Uh, what, what's your current device? I should have asked you this at the beginning. What What are you carrying now for your main smartphone? A lot of people are probably going to get upset at me about this, but... <laughs> well, welcome to the podcast, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, I switched from using a 4S to a Galaxy S4. So I switched from iOS to Android. And in, in some sense, you, you feel that this is a, uh, a defection that, that will anger some people? Yes, because a lot of people say the iPhone is the way to go. iOS is the way to go due to accessibility. No, I'm not talking that because it is if you want to have 50 different workarounds to get things done. Hmm. 
there's two different philosophies, just like in the cyber world, there's two different philosophies of iOS and Android, correct? Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah, in, in every sense, yeah. Here's the thing. With Apple, if they break something, say they break moving around headers in Safari, basically the bold text that's on, on uh, uh, web pages are headings, and you can move down by different headings and find things real quickly, mm -hmm. and rather quickly. Say they break that in Safari, and you um, email uh, accessibility at apple.com and you say, hey, this is broken, here's how it's broken, here's the steps to reproduce this, and they come back and say, well, it's not reproducible, but we will try to fix it in our next version. You're stuck with that until the next version comes out. Right. And, okay, the next version comes out, and they still haven't fixed it. So what do you still do? The, it's the same cycle over and over and over again. Right. I have found that to be very ineffective and, honestly, a, a pain in the butt. It's you know, hugely frustrating, yeah. Why, why should I have a company dictate to me what I can and can't do with my device. So is the situation on Android like the, the polar opposite? I mean, is it a situation where you find a, a defect like that and then suddenly you're on an XDA thread and it's fixed in, in a week? Well, the thing with that is when Apple updates their device devices, you get updated. Now with Android, the screen reader, which is to talk back and the Braille overlay, which is called Braillebeck, sometimes will they work in tandem together. Mm -hmm. I'll explain throw back in a minute. But once they update it, once developers, TalkBack developers update it, because so we're on beta, we're on TalkBack version 3.5.0 beta 3. Once beta 4 comes out, I'm able to go to their website and download the APK onto my uh, S4 and my Nexus 7 and test that out and report bugs and get things fixed. So, so in, in this way, like the, the formerly much trumpeted open Android model is actually a real solid benefit to a group right. of people who are, would have a major problem with this on iOS. Right. Now, when the 3GS came out, I would, say stay, I would have said stay away from Android because it wasn't where it needed to be. Now, it's halfway there and what I mean is there's a lot more unlabeled buttons as far as um, the accessibility layers concerned between iOS and Apple uh, I'm sorry uh, iOS and Android mm -hmm. but with 4.3 if you get a device with 4.3 or KitKat 4.4 you're now able to label those buttons so to me there's no accessibility barrier anymore with between iOS and Android. It's basically, what do you want your device to do? And in that same vein, I'm suddenly struck by the realization that you have a Galaxy S4, which is one of these few devices that has, um, for at least the, the cited version of these software builds, a lot of support for um, a hovering input. Like you can hover a thumb over the screen, and it will, you know, you, you can you can do all that kind of air view stuff, air right. gesture stuff. Is there any capacity? Is there any app or service that takes advantage of that ability and lets you hover over a function before you activate it, so that it can tell you what it is before you tap on it? No. And uh, there should be. Yeah. Well, the thing is that that is when you try to turn those on. Mm -hmm. say, uh, Android will come and say, "Hey, come up and say, hey." Uh, Talkback needs to be disabled for this to work. Okay, fine. You know, right? It doesn't right. Really, really matter to me as much, just as long as it as it works. Now, I'm still waiting for the S4 to get 4.3 on AT and T. So we're waiting, or rather, I'm waiting for that. So, and what improvements will that bring uh, in in terms of stuff that's relevant to you, to your uses? Faster editing. So editing with 4.2.2 Jelly Bean is a pain in the butt. Editing the uh, the particular callouts and things. Well, editing text like through text messages. Oh, or, I see. So it that'll be greatly improved, and just being able to label buttons that developers have not even labeled, and in the case of uh, Podcaker Pro, which is a podcast player that I use, emailing the developer doesn't even help. So you know, <laughs> I'll be able to take that those buttons. The, the, the labels for those buttons and distribute them to other people that use that app as well. 
Wow. So more and more, I'm just uh, I'm struck by the notion that, you know, this kind of argument that we've left behind uh, often in the sighted world of, of like Android is open versus the rest of this, which is right. walled gardens like that. That's kind of a I think everyone got burned out on that argument and it's not really had a lot anymore. But it still continues to be very relevant for you, and that's that's really interesting. But you still have to wait for major releases to correct exactly. foundation yeah. level stuff. People fight over the Lightning versus you, uh, mini USB yeah. things. We still do that too. I still think mini USB is the way to go because it's universal, don't go, yeah, universal and compatible with Lightning. You know, I'm not going to go out and buy a forty dollar cable. <laughs> Well, uh, well, I see. It's funny because I thought you would have said lightning because lightning you can insert in either direction, and even for yeah. those of us with um, you know more typical sight, it's it's easier. Yeah. Well, here's the thing with that: still being able to feel it, try to figure it out. I don't get frustrated with you know. Okay, I put the cable in the wrong way, so I'm just going to take a second to flip it over and plug it back in. That doesn't bother me. I don't. Understand. <laughs> you don't give up on the first try like the rest of us. Right, well, don't, you're not going to charge today. <laughs> <laughs> you, see, you seem like a, a very patient person, Aaron. Where there's, I, I think, uh, I have to be. Um, there, yeah, yeah. I imagine you do. Can, can you, can you kind of walk me through, like, you know, for example, when I wake up in the morning, I grab my phone off the nightstand, I check my email, I go to some of my favorite websites. Right. What is that like? What does a morning process look like? What what apps do you check, and what do you do on your phone? Well, before I used Android, and the reason I, one of, another reason that I switched is because I was tired of spending money on apps that I never used. You know, I calculated how many, how, how much I spent using Apple, uh, Apple products rather, and it was over a thousand dollars. Now, it's calculated the same thing with Android, it was it's about one hundred and twenty. So for me, the savings on that is totally worth it. Right. And being able to do it again, being able to do what I want with my phone, you know, I uh, I follow a life hacker on Twitter, and they said that signage mod, the uh, the app was out, so I did. I got it on my Nexus Seven, and now my Nexus Seven is rooted. I didn't have to do anything to it, and right. so exploring all those options uh, as well. And you know, I'm a geek by heart. I love doing that kind of stuff. My fiance has an iPhone. Unfortunately, she doesn't. So, you know, that's totally fine. But so what I usually do is I'll get up in the morning, I'll unplug my phone, I'll check, see if I have any text messages or email. And, and, and well, let, let's, let's step back a sec. So, so to go to the text messaging app, as you mentioned before, it's kind of muscle memory. You know, it's sort of on the bottom of the phone or something, and you click right into it. I can use Google now. I've, I, I run Nova Launch on my S4. And so I have it set up to if I double tap the home button, Google Now comes up and I say, okay, launch text messages or do whatever wow. I want to do. That's awesome. Now, in, in terms of, I don't know if, Brandon, if you were uh, only halfway done with your point there, but I'd like to integrate a, a point that Joe Levi uh, raised, if I, if I may. You have all these things that, uh, Aaron, that are voice guided. Uh, that 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 blast out of the speakerphone and kind of presumably kind of <laughs> are get annoying after a while. Is there any provision in these various services for using a Bluetooth headset instead? Can you uh, you know just pop something in your ear and have the voiceover routed yes. through there? Yeah, you can. Which is but pretty cool. You, you do not, I'm guessing. Well, I don't. But there are there's a company called Aftershocks. A F T E R S H. Okay, Z. And these are bone conduction headphones. Basically, they sit on your bone uh, in front of your ear, mm -hmm. and your ears are free to hear the environment around you. And I have the wired set up because I use more than just my phones, my, my phone and my tablet to listen to audio. I have a, a, a digital book player that I use, which basically allows me to read. Uh, to read books, and that's all through audio. So that's the only reason I have the wired version. Now, they do have a Bluetooth version that you can hook up and use with phones and ta uh, Bluetooth phones and tablets, and a lot of people really like those as well. 
Wow. Okay. Yeah, because it, it it would seem like a total wasted opportunity to not use that that kind of audio capability. Um, as Joe Levi, we we solicited listeners. I meant to mention this at the top of the show. We solicited questions from the team, and uh, in preparation for this podcast, so we got a lot of, of good stuff here. Uh, Joe Levi also asks: Are there any options in any of these accessibility features on a smartphone to turn off the screen, but keep the digitizer on to help extend battery life? Well, with Android, there's an app called Shades that basically will make the screen go black, but it won't turn off the screen. Okay. Which is so, good for AMOLED. That's yeah, like keeping the screen on. Yeah, it's basically it's like a, it's, it's making your content private. The same thing with voiceover. You do a three-finger three finger triple tap, and that will turn on what they call screen curtain. It's basically privacy mode. So if you don't want people you know, looking at what you're doing, then, you know, that's a good way to go. Does it save battery life? No. You still have to have your screen down, turned all the way down, or do something to, you know, conserve battery life or save battery life as well. You know, it would make all of these things sort of not necessary, and I've read about this technology for years, and it might be so far off, but screens that can actually have texture and detail and buttons and and braille have you heard anything about the the progress there aaron and these these screens that you can actually feel there have been just uh i i i um we uh, yeah i am also a host on uh, the hcb2 uh, how to be blind podcast and we've gone over this before where they have developed or our company or a uh, a university has developed a screen that you're able to feel. And I, I would like to see that, but I, again, I don't know if it would be practical or not. Because you know, once you're done filling the image, do you still have a clear? You know, will you have a clear understanding of what's going on, rather, rather than you know, listening through a uh, speech synthesizer that can you can run it as fast as possible. So I guess it might even slow you down a little bit if, if it's not done right. That's interesting. It's, I, I'm, I'm kind of perusing the, uh, the, the team questions here. And, yeah, I mean, it, it keeps coming back to this thing where a lot of people keep asking, you know, in terms of the devices you use, are more physical controls better while we wait for these screens to be developed? Are, are, would, you, would you still prefer or are there people in, in the community... Uh, of the visually impaired who still prefer physical keyboards. I imagine there must be. There is. I actually have a friend who I went to guide dog school with who uh, got a Motorola Q because of me. Um, uh-huh. And he still uses it. He said he still uses the Moto Q, huh? He said that he will not go to a touchscreen unless he absolutely has to. Sure. It's, it's a shame, you know, that there's really just... You look at Samsung and HTC, all these companies, they don't... They're not doing hardware keyboards anymore, period. It's like right. all of this year, there have been none. None. Yeah, there's like the Droid 4, I think, and that's that's about it. I think two people might have bought that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, two people. Maybe maybe three, maybe four. Well, and that's a good question. I, that, that segues into a question from Adam Dowd. I mean, broadly speaking, do you feel, Aaron, that the mobile smartphone world is doing enough to accommodate persons with disabilities? Is the sector being accommodated or largely ignored, he asks. I think it's a great question. Mm -hmm. It is. Well, and when you take disability, we need to look at the whole broad spectrum, not just visual impairments. We need to look at people that have motor issues that, you know, that are blind and vision impaired, that are hearing impaired, you know, whatever. And if we look at it from that kind of perspective, not just looking through a lens, then I would say it's really not. Because if we look at the fights we're having to do or that we've had to do with Amazon to make their app accessible, to make their hardware accessible and everything else, it's still kind of, we're still having to fight for it. And people are, you know, are saying, well, he's blind or she's blind or he's, you know, he, he's in a wheelchair or whatever. And I, I don't want to accept that. or I don't know what to do with that. So it's about a bias and it's about letting uh, letting sighted individuals, normal people, 
see that people with disabilities can do whatever you can do with just a little bit of help. Right. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of, it's, it's a, that's a really nice and broad way of, of looking at it. And I'm just wondering how that jives or doesn't with these corporations whose, of course, their primary function is, is making money. Adam Dowd was very good enough to, very good to source something here where he's saying about 1.2% of Americans uh, are, are blind. Is that, is that a figure that you are familiar with, Aaron? Is that completely right or completely wrong? It's from ABC News. That is completely half. <laughs> oh, I mean, 1.2% of Americans, I'm sorry, being blind and owning a smartphone, that's a crucial component of that statement. Sorry. Well, he's, it's right about the blindness perspective. The mobile smartphone perspective, I'm not really sure. Just because, you know, we are having a lot of uh, new uh, people, new people, uh, baby boomers, people that have, you know, again, lost their sight from micro degeneration, have oh, come from um, Iraq with, who are blinded or whatever, really are scared of the prospect of just a glass screen and don't know how it's going to affect them. And really, it's really frustrating when you're trying to learn something with no buttons or no tactile, uh, no tactile uh, feedback to them. Because with the least tactile feedback, you can say, okay, I can press the start button, which is over on the left. Yeah. Down three clicks, that's messaging, press the enter, move right one, and I can get to my conversation, move down, and I can read all my conversations. Whereas with the screen, with a uh, smartphone, uh, whether that be iOS or Android, you have to move your finger around and you have to memorize where everything is and it may lose focus, it may not. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of variables that factor into that as well. So we, we seem to be in some kind of like middle ground, some limbo between uh, a world of physical buttons that were easier and if some future world where either voice prompting or tactile displays takes hold and in the in the world that we exist in right now, I mean, you have the Galaxy S four. Is there? I mean, what what's your what would be your ideal phone right now if you could have any of them? Would you stick with your S four from an accessibility perspective, or or would you jump back to iPhone, or would you even try out a different platform like like Windows Phone, which Adam Lane was asking about? Well, until they improve on iOS seven, the UI, uh, I. I I don't know if I can go back there because I can't even look at my fiance's phone without having to pull out a magnifier or have somebody else help me with it because it's so bright and vibrant. Oh. <laughs> you know? Even even the visually impaired have some uh, have strong opinions about iOS the, seven. The fluorescent green uh, call button. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, but Michael, I think you were you're trying to ask uh, from Adam Dowd's question. You know, if you look, if it's true that somewhere around one two percent of the population, smartphone using population, has have eyesight problems. If if you're Apple and you have an R and D budget and you want to come up with new technologies, you're going to spend that money for the 98% because you're trying to make a profit. You're not going to spend a billion dollars investing in special screen raising technology that would make it possible for those without sight to, to feel an okay button. And and that's and that's kind of a shame because it really puts behind uh, the the interests of people that, have, that that can't see. Well, the thing with Apple is, and he, this is just another gripe with him that I have, is Universal accessibility. Basically, that means anything, whether that be an iOS device, an Android device, a Windows Phone device, a Nexus 7, an iPad Mini, iPad Air, god awful name. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's, better than, it's better than iPad, which you know we all thought was a joke. Better than iPad 2 or. It's better than an iPad 2014, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or if. We would have universal accessibility, meaning a swipe right is a swipe right no matter what device you're on. And a you know, two finger or a three finger flick down can get you to a notification shade or whatever, whatever device you're on mm -hmm. would help a lot 
better if Apple would stop making these stupid patent purchases and stupid patent laws that say we have control over the home button or we have control over swiping gestures because then you limit what other companies like Google and Windows Phone have to do to make their make their stuff accessible, and that irritates the crap out of me. Sure, it really, it really stifles the. Uh, yeah, and well, that's the reason I will not not use those kinds of products because I want to help people understand that that is not the way to go. Well, that's an interesting question because we have similar arguments in terms of user interface all across the the spectrum, where it's like. Do we really want to be in a world where everyone has a notification shade that you swipe down from the top, everyone has a launcher, everyone has some home screens that you can do something with? Like, they're all, for as many different paradigms as there are, they are all kind of gelling into, there are these standards, there's these pylons that they're all woven around. But it sounds like, Aaron, in your community, that would be, it would be really advantageous if there were some standards, like you say, like a universal thing, no matter what platform you're on, Three finger swipe down will get you your notifications, or you know yeah. something like that. So it well, sounds like you're you're an advocate of that. Yeah. Or well, if you skin it, like it, like Samsung or HTC with the HTC One and Sense Five have done, it's actually accessible. So if you're going to skin it, fine or whatever, just make sure it's accessible from the start. Mm-hmm. It's not that you're losing. You're not under. You're not really realizing it, but you're you're shooting yourself in the foot because you're going to lose revenue when you could have gained it. If if you had the marketing push to say, hey, this is accessible to everybody, no matter what. Right. Hey, hey, uh, hey Aaron, I, I know we're getting to the end of our window here, but I want to I want to end with a little bit, of, and not to steal your uh, your uh, ending remarks, uh, Michael. But I want I want to yeah, I want to I want to hit another Adam Adam Lane question before we go. But go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, I, I was gonna I was gonna try to get at what Aaron you are excited about what what is uh, what you think is coming around the corner maybe in a year or five years that will really improve your life when as it pertains to technology okay I'm really excited about anything voice dictation I'm really excited about Google Glass if they can get that price down to 300 for that for, for those I'm definitely getting those you know That's I don't care stupid why, why are you why are you excited about Google Glass? Just because I see a lot of potential in it. I see a, a you know, uh, not having to pull out my phone every few seconds to check and make sure I'm on the right path, you know, walking downtown to get to the Arby's or get to the mail or get to, uh, you know, the bank or whatever. And it, it's, I don't know, it's just I guess other people are excited about it. And I'd like to, I'm always Raring and ready to try something new, and I guess that's just the key. I'm, I'm going to ask the the no brainer question here. I mean, in your usage of glass, people who are who are able similarly to you, you'd be talking about acoustic input, right? You, the earpiece, the bone conduction stuff, right? Just, right. Yeah, it's because like right now, you have to take your smartphone out of your pocket to trigger an audio cue or to ask um, whatever GPS app you're using. You know wh- how far you are from your destination. Whereas with glass, you'd be wearing it, and you would get it right right in your ear as it was relevant, right? Exactly. That's so interesting. I never thought about Google Glass in that way. I mean, it's kind of like the perfect dictation, hands-off product. I mean, you could you can talk to it, and it can talk to you, and you don't have to touch your phone, and... Wow, I would be, I would be, I am excited about it, but uh, now I'm even more excited about it because it can help. Yeah, Yeah, no, that's solid. I want to ask, um, while we're talking about new new products and new new platforms, I mean, Adam Lane did ask me to to find out if you had seen any of the new accessibility support in in Windows Phone 8. Because, say again? I said I did watch his video on that. I have not actually gone out and actually seen a Windows device with that on it. Mm hmm. It, it's it's always interesting to to hear how a platform that's you know far behind trying to catch up deals with some of these non mainstream you know concerns. And I, do you think there's an opportunity there for brands like Microsoft or like BlackBerry, BlackBerry even to to kind of differentiate themselves as um, as Sidekick once did for the uh, the deaf community? They can try, but iOS and Android have such a hold on this industry as of now. Mm-hmm. I don't know if it's going to get anywhere. The problem with Microsoft is they'd like to piggyback off of other people. 
And from an accessibility standpoint, what I mean by that is when you go out and buy a Windows computer, uh, Windows Narrator on uh, Windows 8 is okay, it's not the best. And yeah. the thing it's it's really stupid and it just doesn't. <laughs> It just doesn't work, Microsoft. Go back to the drawing board. Have somebody that knows what they're doing do it right. So, okay, you buy, say, a decently spec computer for about five, six hundred, six hundred dollars. You have to go out and get a screen reader um, for about a thousand to eight hundred dollars. Jeez. Wow, that's intense. So, those the prices on those screen readers has not come down really uh, it, since the right, days it, of your Moto Moto Q. Exactly. There is one free option, and that's NVDA, which is non-visual desktop access, which is really good. Wow. But if you're wanting commercial access to Microsoft Word, if you're wanting, if you're wanting the industry standard and screen reading products, it's going to cost you around eight hundred, eight hundred to thousand dollars. Wow. Now, uh, uh, one more question from from Adam's uh, point. I want to kind of pivot that and say. We've we've talked about the brands driving tech, technological developments and the brands offering these products that you use. What about sites like ours, sites that report on the on the tech industry? I speaking personally, I don't see a lot of articles about accessibility features, and I almost never see a review. And I will toss ours in along with this that covers those features at all. Are there specific sites that you visit? Are there, uh, in in terms of tech review sites, tech commentary sites that specifically cater to your needs? There are. Um, one of the, uh, there's a few. Um, one of them is mine, uh, blindpodcaster dot com, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, the the cast podcast. And what I intend to do with this is not to not exclude any accessibility or technology out of it. Um, but I do want to focus on Android because a lot, um, a lot of sites that do accessibility really don't focus on it a lot. So that's the main point with that. A lot of the sites for um, Apple devices, there's AppleVis, A-P-P-L-E, uh, V-I-S dot com. That's, based, that's a really, really good site for app accessibility. There's a lot of podcasts out there. There's uh, that Android show. Uh, and also that AndroidShow.com that talk about Android from an accessibility standpoint. Really? Yes. There's Triple Click Home that talks about um, Apple and all the accessibility. And just in a general sense, there's also uh, the SeroTalk.com, uh, which is, it's just, that's S-E-R-O-T-A-L-K, and they talk about um, general accessibility stuff as well. So I, that's a lot of the um, ones that I listen to. And also there's uh, accessible devices uh, as well. Well, that's good. I'm, I'm glad. I, I guess I shouldn't be surprised that there is that long a list of resources specifically geared toward this, but I, I am a little bit, and I'm, I'm actually pleasantly surprised. So I'm glad that this is getting the coverage it needs, because it's certainly, as of now, it's certainly not getting the mainstream coverage that, um, that I think maybe it deserves. Right, right. Yeah. Well, and why should it? It's a very small population. It's true, but you know, for a, it's it's not that we're in in need of more things to talk about in technology. Like we spend our entire, at least I do. I spend my entire day, my entire week, my entire months um, behind because new stuff is constantly happening. There's no way to cover it all. But at, at points, you do want to get away from this world where it's like, all right, well, there's been a point update to this that makes maps a little better. You want to talk about something different, and that's why it's been really, really great to to have you on the show to to get to give us some really important perspective here. So, thank you for 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 joining us. Yeah, it's uh, it's really a perspective changer just to just to think about this stuff. And we take, like I said in the beginning, we take so much of this for granted. You hearing and, and and vision for those of us that are fortunate enough to have have those senses working, and to think about how how we interact with technology. Video you on a real world view. Try closing your eyes for about fifteen minutes and try to do something that you can that you do with sight and figure out how you can do it without it. Yeah, I I did have one really quick question. Um, is there any sort of science, and hopefully there's a quick answer because I know we're really out of time. Is there is there any science that is that has hope for 
um, people that don't have vision. I, I, I read about this in some magazine a long time ago where s- they're trialing this thing where they can do something to the, an eye to make it see again. Do you know anything about that, Aaron? There is stem cell research that can be done, but it's only for certain um, certain eye prognosis because there's thousands upon thousands of different um, eye disorders and eye conditions. So only certain numbers can be targeted at this point. Got it. Okay. Aaron, I hope this isn't the last time we'll get to chat with you because it's been excellent. Um, f- for anybody who may have missed it, please tell everyone where they can find you on the rest of the Internet, uh, at, particularly at your website. Oh, definitely. Uh, the website is blindpodcaster.com. That's B-L-I-N-D-P-O-D-C-A-S-T-E-R dot C-O-M. And uh, that's just a blog and podcast that um, I maintain and work on. You can also follow me on Twitter, twitter.com slash blindpodcaster. Um, you, you can obviously see a trend here. <laughs> you can email me. Uh, my primary email is blindgeek1989, B-L-I-N-D-G-E-E-K-1989 at gmail.com if you have any questions or comments, concerns regarding uh, podcasting, audio, you know, accessibility anything and i will um, help as much as possible perfect well once again that's about my fourth time doing it but really want to thank you for your time today aaron this has been a, a very educational show and uh hopefully our audience feels the same way we really thank you for sharing your expertise with us i yeah. appreciate it for uh, letting me come on and talk about it for an hour <laughs> Well, like I say, hopefully it won't be the last time. Um, So for now, uh, listeners, thank you for sticking with us. That is going to do it for another episode of the Pocket Now Weekly. Be sure to find us on Twitter, guys. Aaron is once again at Blind Podcaster on Twitter and at blindpodcaster.com. Brandon is at Brandon Miniman. And as always, you can find me at Captain Two Phones. You can also follow Pocket Now officially at Pocket Now on Twitter, as Pocket Now on Instagram, Facebook, and Google Plus. And visit us at forums.pocketnow.com to share your own thoughts. If you enjoyed the podcast, please leave us a review on iTunes or Xbox Music. And if you have a topic, question, or suggestion for the show, or you just want to say hi, you can email us a brief message at podcast at pocketnow.com. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next week. What say we, we do an outro, guys? You ready? Yes. Cool. Can there be a drum solo? <laughs> no, you you have to save your drum solo for your last podcast ever. Wow. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> really unfair, but okay.